Okay, let us, and Arshana and I, again, I did not schedule a break for us, so here we go. The, uh, Round three. You are uh, torturing me. <laughs> uh, well, I know, I have to, uh, I have to any... torture all of the above. I can complain because the chief medical officers are here. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'm, I'm just here to learn from them. I'm, I'm the least qualified, obviously, but happy to join. So welcome, welcome everyone. I think we have a full house. We have a full house and Chris, you're the millennial CEO that is managing yeah. everyone that I heard from Carol. <laughs> the millennials are the CEOs here. So, um, so we're going to start with uh, just everyone introducing themselves just broadly but also something fun, one thing personally that you do for your own mental resilience, basically a mental health hack. So let's start with you, Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Blair. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Neuroflow. Uh, I get to work with a lot of CMOs, uh, like we're joined on here today. Um, and uh, let's see, mental health hack, I try to work out every day. There's nothing like a run to clear your mind, uh, get a lot of things done uh sweating sweating you know get a good sweat on awesome and peter peter hi, excuse me hi everybody peter antal i'm the uh, chief medical officer at amwell and president of the amwell medical group uh it's a pleasure to be here today thank you for the invite uh and i don't mean to sound so repetitive but uh uh my uh meditation so to speak is uh is when i'm on my bicycle and that's where I have uh, interesting thoughts because you're on your own or I'm on my own. And uh, uh, and it's just soothing, relieving, burns a lot of calories so then I can eat uh, whatever I want and and, and not gain weight. <laughs> where, where do you bike? Um, like a gravel bike or mountain bike? Uh, road bike, yeah, road bike. Nice. nice. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Ian? Ian? Yeah, hi everyone. Great to be here with, uh, with you all and uh, some old friends and some making some new ones here. So good to see you, Archana, Peter, uh, and Bambi, um, and uh, Patrick, Chris. Great to great to meet you all. I don't think we've we met before. Sorry, I couldn't attend the yeah the, the earlier session. <laughs> but uh, um, I'm the chief medical officer of Doctor on Demand, uh, president of the professional corporations. Uh, just in case you know some people don't know about Doctor on Demand, you can think about it as a 50 state virtual medical practice that has um, you know started out virtual urgent care then virtual behavioral health and, and now virtual primary care. And we recently just completed, and I, I think it's pretty much out there at this point and announced that we had a merger with, with Grand Rounds Health. Um, and so there you're seeing um, data and analytics uh, to, to drive patients to, um, to, to quality expert medical opinion, navigation services through the healthcare system. So, so really, um, you know, very, very nice compliment to, to the medical practice that, that we have built. Um, and my hack is, gosh, you know, I mean, it's, I think uh, it's similar to what Peter said. I, I think I've found that I've, especially during COVID, I have turned off the news. I think that, so there'll be one hack of like, I, <laughs> I stopped watching the news. I yeah. pick which news I'm going to, uh, that I'm going to ingest uh, and consider. And I've, um, yeah, just, I listen to music now and, and which I've always loved music. So I've really gone more to that and I'll, um, and I'll turn it on and sit outside and either listen to the music or just listen to birds and nature and the wind and those types of things, which might sound kind of cheesy and cliche, but it's done a lot to, to calm my mind. And then I remind myself about, yeah, what's just, you know, how lucky I am. And I think that that reflection has been, been pretty good. And I try to do that um, at least at least for a little bit, you know, at least for a few minutes. If I can get like 20 minutes every day, I'll, I'll try to do that. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. Uh, music or like head banging music or what's... <laughs> I, you know, it's fun. It depends. <laughs> Tribe, Tribe Called Quest is one of my favorites, which is, which is, uh, which is a hip hop group. If you remember them, if you're my age, Chris probably is like, who are those guys? But, uh, <laughs> but if he's a, if he's a good music connoisseur, he's found them somewhere. Um, but no, I, I like uh, r and I, I, Honestly, I can listen to any kind of music, country music. It, it can all take me to the same place. <laughs> nice. <Great question. laughs> all right. Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, uh, Pat Carroll, I'm Chief Medical Officer at Hims and Hers, a direct -to consumer telehealth company, and um, glad to be here. Um, my favorite hack is uh, I'm fortunate to live near the water down here in Westport, Massachusetts, and I, I go out every morning I can to surf cast 
for striped bass and wow. it teaches me patience because I never catch anything. <laughs> but being out in nature and seeing the beauty as sun rises and occasionally getting a bite is good enough for me. That's awesome. Great. Thank you so much, all of you, to be here. I think we have met each one of you in a prior session. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this, um, this session, too. We are focused on mental behavioral health, but I wanted to kind of understand there is a lot of tele and virtual care that you do and offer how are you differentiating yourself from from each other because you know with so much digital health happening it's all a blur so if it would be great for us to um share what your key differentiators are and i will begin the round robin the, the other way around so i will begin with you pat um and of course you know you have seen the walgreens world before and now at, at at your new, uh, not so new gig, uh, how are you differentiating yourself from the rest? Yeah, so I, you know, I've been two years now at Hims and Hers. And when I started there, I, I came there for, uh, on the basis of a commitment from our, from our CEO that we we're gonna expand scope of care from beyond you know, hair loss and sexual dysfunction to do really uh, impactful conditions, not to say those others are not, but uh, about eight months ago, we got into behavioral health and it really was a function of the need from our demographic and our demographic very clearly is millennials and younger. And what we saw is about 30% of that population uh, struggle with anxiety and depression. That was even before pandemic and it's been worse since then. So we've offered anxiety and depression treatment off our platform with board certified psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, very price transparent um, to the point that we can offer unlimited access as well as medication sent to these customers at a price point that's lower than their average yearly deductible, which a lot of them are high deductible health plan folks and, and they have about a $1,600 to $1,800 deductible. So we're really proud to, to say that you know, in the eight months, we now serve 90% of the population in the country. We're going to be in 50 states soon. And we're going to offer, we already offer group sessions, but we're going to offer individual psychotherapy too. So I think how we're differentiated, we, we offer really great service on, on anxiety and depression, as all these companies do. But we are also really focused on a demographic. They relate to our brand. We are the access point to care for them, like none other. Um, you know, we're going on completing 3 million visits off our platform in less than three years. So uh, we've really resonated with the demographic that has a huge need for behavioral health services. Patrick, I just want to ask just, uh, are you, are you uh, a subscription model service? So do you, uh, your customers pay on a subscription basis? Or yes. Yeah, so the way it works is like our other chronic management platforms is someone will come on uh, they'll follow an evidence-based guideline in input uh, form. Uh, these are synchronous visits, although most of our primary care visits are asynchronous. We've intentionally done synchronous for behavioral health. They get access to a provider and they get medications that are appropriately sent to them every three months uh, delivered to home. Uh, so it's a subscription service. We know our demographic really well. Coming from Walgreens, I hate to say this, they don't like hanging out in CVS and Walgreens, I can tell you. They like medications delivered to them. They like a virtual health platform access point. Um, my three millennials don't have primary care physicians. They don't go online to access a primary care physician. They use a hims and hers or, or companies like ours, to tell you the truth. Um, Ian, I wanted to ask you, yeah. How do you differentiate from, especially, and I know that there's some of the solutions that today that we are, you know, discussing, like Peter is here, and this, but also um, there's so many of the virtual care providers. Sorry, um, you hear noise because somebody decided to shred the tree across my street. <laughs> Fair with work-life balance, okay. Um, so co coming back to doctors in demand, green round combo compared to dif how do you differentiate from you know the crossovers in 98.6 of the world also along with the folks that are here and then 
And then on the horizon, this Amazon care starts to come in and start to eat the market share. How do you, how do you differentiate on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I actually think we probably have a lot of overlap here. So we, um, you know, it's a, it's a common question to think of like, well, how, you know, for a marketplace that's not sure how to differentiate or how to understand the differences between the companies, you are always looking for like, well, what is the thing that is different? So, so if I say some things that people say, well, no, we do that too, or I think we do some of that, I would just say maybe this, these are the, the perceptions that I have, but, but, uh, but the way that we, uh, you know, and I actually think we probably are very similar to what, you know, I think Peter and I probably think alike and have been at our companies for a very long time. And so we've had enough conversations that I would guess that like, you know, he's going to have a harder time picking the differentiator because because <laughs> he's going to go last and I get to go first or second. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, I think we, we really, we approached it as with an employee practice. I mean, that was really important. Um, having the engagement from the clinicians for us was a really important piece because from the very beginning, we were, um, we were intent on impacting quality. And, and, we, and from the very beginning, it was, you know, how do you impact, you know, uh, the value-based care equation? How do, you, um, how do you deliver outstanding quality of care at a reasonable cost, um, but really just continue to deliver value to, to a population, right? And telemedicine is a great platform to deliver access without question. The quality comportion is much easier to control and govern if you employ the practice and have a high level of engagement and year over year, you can essentially develop them in that, I'm not, you know, it's, it's maybe not clear that it's a specialty, but having experience and expertise um, and understanding the extra level of energy or credibility that needs to be communicated and the extra effort to develop a relationship with a patient across distance on a two-dimensional screen. I think all of those things need to be there to, to build the trust that then gives you the clinical outcomes um, and, the, and again, to deliver the value that you want to have. So I think we, you know, we really started with that. I thought Pat had some great, great statistics on, you know, the millennial generation. It's not just millennials. I mean, very few people are now engaging care and finding themselves with primary, you know, engaging primary care and establishing that longitudinal relationship. We need to show them where those are valuable. Um, and so the last place I would say where I think we are, where we're doing that and leveraging the platform of telemedicine and virtual care um, to provide access is really in an equitable way. So one final differentiator for us is that 43%, uh, so almost half of our clinicians within Doctor On Demand are actually black indigenous people of color. And this is something that we, you know, it's not been a commercial thing for us. We don't, you know, like it's not the way we have sold uh, we actually really just discovered this two years ago about our practice because we said, well, we built a practice. It's an inclusive environment. It is, um, you know, we, we, we wanted to build the environment where people could belong no matter where they were from. That was very important from the very beginning of the practice. But two years ago, we looked back and said, well, what do we look like? Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's take a look at our practice and survey them. And we found some really interesting things there. Um, but yeah, 43% of the practice are, are Black, Indigenous, people of color. Uh, over 70% of the practice are women, 20% um, 20, 20 LGBTQ. Um, so I think we have a very representative practice of what our country actually looks like. And, and I think we can provide culturally concordant care that there's now evidence to prove patients actually need and their, and their outcomes will improve if they can get that kind of care. Just to clarify, you're talking about your practice. These are the people who work for Dr. On Demand or these are the, this, these are the people you serve? Retreat. These are actually people who work for Doctor on Demand. So, so forty three percent of the doctors. The people who you serve too, right? Yeah, exactly. They 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 are rep. Yeah, they they are representative. And if you know the numbers, you know um, five percent of of doctors in the entire country are are actually black. Twenty percent of our doctors, for as an example, are black. And so so we have very strong representation. And this is really important in different areas of care, whether it's behavioral health or what have you. Um, you are able, yeah, you able to find someone who's culturally concordant with you is, is, is really difficult to do for specific conditions, um, and, uh, and different areas of care. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So Peter, how you have a challenge now, <laughs> because, because now you have to differentiate. Uh, that's, that's okay. I, 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 I got, I got more time to take notes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> And, and I, I think Ian's right. I think that there are a lot of things, uh, there are a lot of areas in which we're more similar than different, our two organizations. So I think 
you know, I, I've always been very impressed by Ian and, and his team. And I think both their organizations prioritize quality of care right at the top. Uh, and, 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 and I rightly so. I think that's extremely important. Um, you know, one of the things that is a differentiator uh, for Mwell that, that people often aren't aware of is we are really at our core more of a software as, as a service company than we are a care delivery company. It wasn't as obvious maybe pre-COVID because engagement of providers in brick and mortar practice uh, were, uh, was low uh, and uh, growing, but modestly. Um, but uh, with the explosion of uh, pro, you know, brick and mortar provider engagement during COVID, um, we've seen a dramatic, it's really had a dramatic effect on our business. And um, I think the most recent number is about 80 plus percent of our total volume of visits on all of our white label platforms is occurring with non animal medical group providers. It's providers at our hospital system partners like Cleveland Clinic and Intermountain and New York Presbyterian. And, um, you know, no one predicted COVID, but that really was an inflection point for a lot of things in, in telemedicine these days. And, and that's one example. And so in our software as a service model, um, that increase in volume and activity on those platforms is, is win-win. You know, patients are finding new ways to access care with, with known providers, but experiencing the, uh, the benefits, the convenience and uh, access and, and everything else that's afforded by, by using telehealth as a tool. Um, so that's a, a differentiator. Um, we've always tried all, as well to differentiate ourselves on our technology. Uh, we've been from our inception, even before we had smartphones and, and tablets back in 2007, 8, 9, when we started, we were always about a video-based encounter, not, uh, a synchronous video-based encounter. That's really in our DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll fall back to phone. We can even fall back to a wall phone and a customer service representative bringing the patient into an encounter if we have to, but we really try to try to uh, uh, afford in, 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 in any case possible, a, uh, a uh, video-based synchronous encounter, especially important in medical interventions, seeing the patient you can examine uh, through use of video more than, than one might think. Um, we also think it's very important in behavioral health um, because while you can't always see the whole body, uh, you can see the important parts of the body that uh, that um, tend to be associated with nonverbal communication, um, the affect and other indicators, eye contact, things like that, um, which is, I think, a very important part of a, uh, a good behavioral health interaction, uh, whether it's therapy or psychiatry or other. Um, I, I was just looking, um, you know, last thing I might say in terms of differentiation is we really um, um, have... Uh, striven from the beginning to function, and we call ourselves a medical group, and I noticed Ian did as well, a medical group, not a network. Uh, we're not all employed. We don't uh, use only employed providers. We do have employed W-2 providers, but we have a mix of full-time, part-time, and contractors, uh, but we have a number of, of structures and um, uh, uh, policies and, and uh, uh, various efforts in place to function as a coherent group so that the end product, you know, so that first of all, so that it's a, a collegial place to work, uh, it's attractive for providers, but also so that our end product is a consistent product from a quality perspective and from a patient experience perspective. Can I quickly ask a question of uh, you, Peter, and then also Ian, uh, what is, what is, how do you define outcome, especially not just clinical, but also mental behavioral health? Are they, I call it he dish, because um, <laughs> uh, those are kind of a little bit of a stretch. Um, so I wanted to understand, did, did you build your own or are you going with the national standards or how, how are you addressing outcome? And I'll come right at you, Chris, right after this. Yeah. 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 Um I'll go first, Ian, and then you can take some notes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we work with a lot of health plans and another, I, I didn't mention another, maybe somewhat of a differentiator for, for us uh, relative to others, some others, is that most, uh, we try as hard as we can to do claims-based uh, payment uh, whenever, whenever possible. And um, that means working with uh, health plans and employers. And um, so that's the language of health plans. That's uh, a driver for health plans, the HEDIS measures. And so we certainly try to be uh, adherent and, and attentive to the, the, those things that are prioritized as HEDIS measures. You know, outcomes are not easy uh, in general. I'm speaking uh, broadly, not just behavioral health. 
you know, the vast majority of outcomes, uh, uh, sorry, the vast majority of measures are not direct outcomes measures, but are instead uh, process measures that are proxies for outcomes. And one of the challenges with outcomes is, uh, the, is the source of truth. Uh, often the source of truth for true outcomes is, exists at the claims level. And, and so the payers understand how many visits it took to complete a, uh, an episode of care um, we don't always have visibility to that that data, um, but certainly well, things that are are able to be compared uh, across uh, companies, across uh, providers like PHQ eight or nine, uh, GAD, uh, PHQ two, even in in the primary care space, um, we we certainly evaluate those. We've looked at quality of life scores as well, and those exist for us more so. Um, in terms of our, our sales and marketing efforts to be able to demonstrate that we're an effective tool. Yeah, that's great. I, I won't, I mean, I think right at the end, Peter covered what the way we, we approached it from the beginning was PHQ2 for the screening level. That includes what we do in the primary care practice or urgent care practice. And then obviously if you trigger that, then you, you may automatically spill over then into the behavioral health practice. Uh, you may end up then going through a PHQ9 or a GAD7. Um, we, so we've, we've definitely looked at, um, you know, look at our ability to do that population level kind of screening and baselining and then measure ourselves. The other thing, because we have the integrated practice of a primary care as well as behavioral health practice all within one shop, um, we're beginning to look at chronic disease or disease specific outcomes related to blood pressure or cholesterol or diabetes and really start to say, well, what is happening when someone's seeing us for behavioral health and being treated for these other conditions? Mm -hmm. And are we able to impact those? And are we seeing correlation, at least, if not causation, with improved PHQ-9 and GAD-7 scores and so on? So addressing those needs and, and, the, and, their, um, yeah, and the actual clinical outcome of the, of the physical um, malady, mm -hmm. right, or, or the diabetes or the, or the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, the final thing I'd say is we have, um, you know, we just launched coaching very recently. And Coaching is a subclinical offering, right? And I think you guys had a real, there was a really great conversation actually earlier today. I didn't realize that was on the agenda, but I caught it. It was fantastic. You, uh, you all did a great job walking through with those, um, with those different companies and the different approaches. And so I loved the discussion. Uh, um, and so we are also looking there and we're using a different set of tools, right? We're evaluating, um, but trying to use another evidence-based tool that's different there to, to really uh, pick out, well, and also what's really good subclinical coaching with, with regards to, or compared to um, really good behavioral health treatment. And so, so I think we're looking at it and trying to integrate as much of it as possible because really how all these, you know, I don't think it's gonna be about point solutions or we, we take a certain, you know, much more holistic approach of, you know, we wanna have a primary care practice, we want it to be quality based and we wanna focus it around the whole person. And so um, to do that well, that includes being able to measure clinical outcomes, maybe disease specific, like a PHQ-9 for depression or a GAD-7 for anxiety. But also we wanna measure the relationship because of what I said in the beginning, which is the relationship actually matters. And that's very hard to find those. Like there's not very many, you know, validated models for actually measuring how therapeutic is the relationship, but we have a tool that we've found that we're using for that. And, um, and there's some nice work that's been done. Um, I wanna say what's out of the Larry Brown Center, Larry Green Center maybe out of, uh, 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 out of, uh, well, I, I, got, I was exposed to it through a primary care collaborative. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really nice tool there that looks at the patient-centered primary care measure, but it has some relationship measures. It has sort of cultural competency and advocacy measures built into it. It's a, it's a nine or 10 or 11 um, item and domain tool. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I think it's, it's important to, you know, to measure across many domains, yeah, to make sure that you know, you're, you're, you're doing the, um, the harder, more complex work of the whole person care. That's nice. Thank you so much. Chris, I know you've been patiently waiting to share your differentiator. So could you share? Yeah. Oh, I've, I've enjoyed uh, listening to Peter, Ian, and, and Patrick. The, I, I think it's very easy in this case. I mean, we work with organizations uh, like, uh, you know, like Dr. Naman or, or like an Amwell, um, because we're not care, a care delivery organization. Neuroflow is an asynchronous mm -hmm. platform that helps measure outcomes in between their appointments. Right. The, the great thing about uh, telehealth is to improving access and providing a new way of delivering that care. Um, what it um, doesn't solve for entirely is the capacity issue of hitting more people uh, with less or the same resources. Right? There's still a shortage of psychiatrists and, and therapists in this country. 
and getting it's about getting the right people to the right level of care and measuring those outcomes in between appointments. If I'm going to see Ian for a, a, an appointment, um, that appointment lasts for a finite period of time. It would be great if I was able to stay connected to him and my provider in some shape or fashion with those same tools and skills that we talked about in my session in between my appointment. And so uh, what we've developed at NeuroFlow is a, a platform to enable that connection to happen uh, and in an asynchronous way to have that provider feedback loop. So we're able to deliver, you know, PHQ twos and nines and GAD twos and GAD sevens and, and a bunch of other uh, screenings and assessments in between those appointments, uh, you know, amplifying the way that care is delivered. Right? NeuroFlow, we're, we're not trying to, we're big believers that the way that we win, uh, you know, the behavioral health challenges today and the way that we bridge that physical and mental health divide is by amplifying the people involved, uh, augmenting the way that, uh, you know, clinicians deliver care um, so that it's a force multiplier. It's a one plus one equals three argument. So when Peter is with a patient, uh, he's able to actually risk stratify and see, okay, where's Chris at, as opposed to using valuable clinical time for administrative sort of things. And, and he could stay connected with me in between that synchronous communication. Um, and so from a differentiation standpoint, there's a lot of point solutions out there. There's a lot of behavioral health um, apps or mindfulness tools. The getting that feedback loop right uh, so that it doesn't impede workflow, but as a, but amplifies that uh, is really tough. And, and we've integrated to EHRs and, and taken that clinical burden personally. Um, our uh, clinical advisors and the, uh, the MDs and the, the LCSWs that we work with closely advise us on what would create more work inadvertently versus what would actually connect that, uh, that patient uh, to the right type of care in their organization uh, so to make those workflows easier. And, and we do that with close to 400,000 patients uh, under contract on the platform today. How, um, quick question on, on that. How do you differentiate yourself from the messenger tools that are already existing uh, with the providers? And then also, is there any automation in these asynchronous communication that is happening? Or are you utilizing a, a live person typing these messages? Yeah, um, no, great question. So the um, usually messenger platforms are either, if they are bi-directional, it's more for like administrative purposes. And that's why we integrate into the EHR. If, you, know, um, you know, Epic has their my chart, uh, Athena Health has their version of it where these patient portals are there, but those are really more for administrative checking your bill, uh, making sure your appointments are set, those sorts of things. Uh, we're able to deliver the clinical screening tools like Ian and Peter were talking about with PHQ-9s. No reason to invent, reinvent those wheels. Or they're, I mean, this is a panel on evidence-based protocols. Those are evidence-based. Uh, we're helping to redefine the way that they're delivered, they're engaged with, and then oh, when you measure them, what happens next? And so going down to the automation piece, um, when if I'm a patient, on, um, on Amwell and I'm uh, doing, and I'm able to do a PHQ-9, I score, let's say I score a 10, moderately depressed. Um, well, then what happens after that? Um, so on Neuroflow, that feedback will go back to Peter or a provider that I'm working with. Um, at the same time, there's branching logic for the patient to say, these are maybe appropriate resources for you based on your demographics, your scores, uh, these are self-help tools like mindfulness or, you know, journaling entries. So you can do, you know, Ian mentioned coaching, like um, motivational interviewing is huge. All right. It's not, so you can get be proactive in, in these sorts of care environments so that not only are you helping the depression, but you're improving adherence with uh, my blood pressure medication uh, and improving that physical health el element in, in in addition to the uh, mental health element of things. And so really it's, it's those two things. It's automating the delivery of self-service tools and providing that feedback so that the higher risk folks can get treated with the human element sooner rather than later and, and triaging that more effectively. Okay. 
So, so Chris, I like how you talk about, you know, you're collaborating because, you know, mental health is an individual and it isn't an, an individual illness. It is a, right. it is an illness that it's a, a family illness, right? It's a friend. This is something that should be taken care of by a community. And so I like how you're, you're bringing people, the care teams together. Now, Arshana jumped into outcomes, but before we talk about outcomes, we probably need to know the treatments. Mm -hmm. And the treatments also stem from our sort of view and our approach to healthcare. And we, Arshana and I have been talking from the start of this program, how we're moving away from sick care to self-care. And we're moving away from this whole pharma science, um, this sort of one input or reductionist approach of just taking a psychotropic for our mental illness toward behavioral science, like um, Ian talked about bringing in coaches or Chris talked about with mindfulness. So from a philosophical standpoint, because we have to start from there, do you agree that we're moving away from this old pharma science to a new behavioral science? And if you agree, has, has that been difficult for you to sort of uh, articulate that to your customers? So let's start with uh, you, Peter. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that it's an oversimplification to say that we're moving from one model to a new model. Uh, I, I think what we are seeing is an acceleration of the use of digital technologies and tools. So I think that we are seeing more uh, uh, self-help, uh, more mindfulness, and mindfulness is, is trending these days um, for the right reasons, because it can be a very effective tool. Um, so I, I think we are seeing an acceleration of many tools that are not pharmacologic, um, but I don't see that in happening in lieu of the proper use of pharmaco pharmacologic tools when appropriate. Uh, where I, you know major uh, depression that's that's you know that that's uh, uh, debilitating, for example, or organic disease like bipolar or or or, or uh, schizophrenia, where where psychotropics are are often going to be first line. Um, but I think we're getting better at the, the non-pharmacological tools as we evolve, and we're getting better at uh, providing new ways to access and different ways for patients to access care. We're also helping overcome stigma. Uh, I hear again and again from different patients or different populations, uh, usually anecdotally, that, oh, I would have never gone and received care at an at a office uh, called psychiatry, but since I can do it from the comfort of my home and I don't have to worry about seeing my neighbor in the waiting room, I'm willing to engage. Uh, so I, I, there's a lot of good evolution happening, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have to be at the expense of the proper use of, of medications when, when necessary or appropriate. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would just say that I feel like we are in a, we, first of all, let's just all acknowledge Bambi. I feel like this was in bed. This is like right underneath your question, which is like, we all just went through the hardest year we've ever been through in our lives. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's like, you know, uh, if that's not the case for you, God bless you. You are the luckiest person in the world because so many people have had just such a hard year. I think it actually has removed a tremendous amount of stigma across the board to where you might say like, we, you know, we all are, have the biggest excuse ever to acknowledge whatever behavioral health or mental health concerns and issues we, we may feel, you know, are, you know, coming face to face with, you know, the challenge of, of, of something so disruptive and, and what emotions does that bring out and so on. And so I agree with Peter though, it's not as simple as just moving, you know, you don't, they're not in com competition with one another. We need the whole spectrum or the gamut of, of, an arsenal, if you will. Um, I think we are probably fighting multiple battles. You kind of you asked a philosophical question, but I, so you're getting a little bit of a philosophical answer. But I think we, I think we are, um, we have a lot that we of work to do. Um, and and so if you ask a doctor that question, it's very natural for us to go to like the look. We have we know we know for the more severely ill and the ICD-10 diagnostic clinical ill patients, we know we can do some things with them, and the medications work very well. But I know there's also a concern probably on the payer side of like, but are, are we over medicating people right now? Because everybody's on something now, you know, and it's kind of like, and are we reaching for that too easily? And so I like that we're having that debate, um, but it's not one or the other. I think we'll, I think we'll all just get smarter as long as we um, learn as much as we can about all the tools and clinical, you know, clinical minded people like myself should not dismiss coaching, which is why we added, right? That's why we've added it. And we should not dismiss the impact of social determinants of health. 
right? Like there's bigger things that are not necessarily clinical issues, but maybe are defined by your zip code that have a huge impact on your, your mental health and your well-being and your ability to find, you know, physical outlets. We talked about going for a run. There are some places where there, there are some people who are not going for a run because it's not a safe thing to do in their neighborhood. So I think there's just, you know, I think that um, we need to figure out uh, the tools that, that, that those individuals need um, and some th sometimes those are not clinical. And so again, I, I think that's one of the things I like a lot about Grand Rounds Health is they've done some of that and built some of their own like social determinants of health assessments, ability to match patients to the benefits there on the front end before they're actually, you know, it's more upstream before you actually end up with a clinical diagnosis. And so I think those are, um, I think that we're gonna see more of that for sure. Um, and, and more um, maybe, you know, point solutions that kind of take on a particular illness or another. But, um, but I agree with uh, yeah, almost everything that Peter said there. Ian, what you were also saying, I, I would build on to that and say, it's not a zero sum game. It's, like, it's about the right care at the right time and using uh, measurement-based care, right? And this is where I think technology can help play a part in helping the care delivery organizations identify well, who actually needs to be on those therapeutics as medications. And then, you know, therapeutics plus coaching could make a world of difference as opposed to just, you know, it's a pill is not going to be the silver bullet. Uh, and if you can enhance that and you can measure outcomes and see, wait a second, this is trending in the wrong direction. Maybe we should think about keeping them off uh, this matter or changing their medication, changing the dosage. You know, you can help. I think data can help inform that, that care delivery. Yeah. Well, I'll ask Pat because you know, you have a unique demographic and, and of course the brand started with prescription of two important medications. So it's almost like, how are you helping your constituents uh, who I, you know, as a practicing clinician, I see there is a little bit of an easier adoption of a medication to treat um, mental illness in, in uh, my younger demographics than older demographics, because of course there is stigma around of course, mental illness, but also around medications for mental illness. There's much more adoption in, in the younger demographic around, yeah, I need help, I need medications too. And so how are you steering towards, how are you developing clinical protocols around that? Yeah, so the core of our business to start with is treatment and access to care for stigmatized conditions. As a primary care physician for 30 years, I saw very few millennials and I think they were uncomfortable talking about the issues that we actually address on hims and hers. And that's why behavioral health made perfect sense. I know as a primary care physician that talk therapy would only go so far for some patients and that medications did have a very valuable role. Um, so we've decided we're gonna offer a holistic approach to behavioral health care. That's both from you know, my, my bias on that, but also many consultants we brought in on it. Uh, we feel like talk therapy alone is not going to get it done for some patients. So we offer the group sessions just around topics like dealing with stress during the pandemic and tremendous, tremendous uptake on that. Those are free group sessions that we still offer today. And then, you know, individual psychotherapy, which we're building out for every state and then access to a prescriber. Um, so I think you have to have a holistic approach to this uh, because, Behavioral health issues, even if you focus on anxiety and depression, they can be very complex and not one size doesn't fit all. Um, it, it, for most patients though, it is a combination of psychotherapy and medications, particularly for our demographic, it seems like that is the most effective, although not every patient will end up on a medication, which is great, but a lot do need that along with psychotherapy. And if I could just maybe add in one, I'm sorry, I, would you mind if I just add in one, one comment as well? Um, you know, I, I hate to say this uh, as, I, as I'm aging, but I've been around healthcare long enough, and most of us have been around reasonably long enough to see how trends kind of come and go, you know, the 90s and the HMO IPA trends and, and whatnot. But um, there was certainly a period where the SSRIs were relatively new or, or were new and they were the big new thing. And, you know, everyone went on Prozac for what, for minor, uh, you know, blips in their life. Uh, you know, I'm obviously exaggerating. 
Um, so, I, but, I, but I think what, what's important to do is to recognize that when something's really trending, there's probably, there may be some value there, but sometimes the pendulum swings a little far during these periods. And, um, and part of the reason I bring that up is let's not forget that, that uh, the tried and true methods of CBT and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and other, other forms of, of talk therapy are still very valuable. And often the, the treatment most associated with uh, long-term remission or re re resolving of the condition. And so, you know, it's important to, rec you know, we have a lot of shiny new toys these days in, in, in health IT, and, and many of them are wonderful and have a role, but, but I think we're also trying to remember what, what is evidence-based and, and well-established and, and often very effective. Yeah, the one thing I would add, too, is um, how we're a little different is we're direct to consumer. It's cash pay, but we kept the price point intentionally very low. And we hear time and again from our patients on our platform, my employer offers this benefit on behavioral health. I think they're going to find out that I'm accessing behavioral health. So they love the anonymity of coming on our platform and their payer doesn't know about it because we don't submit to payers and their employer doesn't know, uh, know about it because we're, we're not really an employer play. We're a direct to consumer and they appreciate that anonymity. It's, it's just, it's a little different. Um, but it's, it's an offering that seems to resonate, particularly for that demographic. So with that and with every, actually just, um, yes. Pat, and I probably will ask Peter and Ian as well, because your broader offerings, yeah. uh, you're not just mental and behavioral health companies. So how is that structured inside your company? Are they separate units um, and separate divisions? Are they more integrated? And then what's usage like? What percent of your users use uh, behavioral health? And that's a question for Peter and Ian as well. But I'll start with you, Patrick. Um, so it, it's run, you know, it's the same business. The quality structure is the same. We do encounter reviews, both randomly and for outliers. So all of that is very similar, but the provider group is distinctly different. For behavioral health, it's board certified psychiatrists and psychiatric nurse practitioners. We felt we needed that level of expertise. Um, so similar in many ways, but different in terms of the provider group. Um, and that, that has worked well for us. You know, we're only in this eight months. We see actually our behavioral health is growing quicker than uh, our initial businesses did. So we anticipate it's going to continue to grow, but it is not the largest segment of our book of visits, to be clear. It's, it's the traditional offerings because they've been around for longer. We've done a lot more marketing. We've done virtually no marketing on the behavioral health. We will at some point, I'm sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, it's a super important part of our practice. Again, we, we made the decision about five or six years ago now to add therapy. And then the year after that, we added psychiatry. Um, and we lumped it all together, Bambi, as behavioral health, which, um, I mean, I, you know that there are different disciplines, right? Psychiatrists prescribe, psychologists do more therapy, but, um, but they're really different. I mean, they actually were just very different practices all together. So I refer to them as different practices because probably because of how I was trained, um, but it is integrated. We share an EHR. So the clinical care that the patient is getting and the, and the, the, um, the encounters all land in the same place. And so anyone who's touching that patient care team and so on can all uh, reference the same health record. So that's one nice piece where there's integration. Um, and then that, there'll be further integration with the, with the merger actually of, of patients uh, external health data, um, uh, claims based data and use of uh, brick and mortar health systems as well as pulling all the way through to referrals. So, so you can kind of start to see where you know you're wrapping your arms around that whole patient and integrating the behavioral health with the with the medical. On your question about volume, about a third, about thirty to forty percent of our practice is now behavioral health. That's that's pretty big. Like that's I mean that's significant when you think about it. Um, it has grown triple digits over the last couple of years. And so if you looked at last year, we would have had you know like October last year, we would have had like a you know, um, triple digit growth. And then from October of last year to now, it's it's triple digit growth again. So I don't know if that's, you know, I think COVID has fueled a lot of that. I don't know if that's um, gonna stay the trend, but if I was to show you a, a curve historically over the seven years or so of, or six years of, of the behavioral, behavioral health combined practice, um, it's really just been a, you know, it's kind of a, it's a pretty straight line up and to the right of, of utilization. 
Um, and um, on average, patients will come for about four and a half to, well, it depends how old, how, you know, but if you look at the cohorts as they come in, anywhere from four and a half to six visits. Uh, so they, you know, they like, patients like it, they establish a relationship and they come back to, to complete a course of therapy. So these are, ther they're, they're accessing therapists, psychologists or psychiatrists, and now you're expanding coaching. Uh, right, and that's, yeah, and the coaching just launched the, uh, this year, so the first quarter of this year, so that's a brand new program. Got it. Is it larger for coaches than the, than the psychologists and psychiatrists? Not yet. I mean, it's just, it's, it's new. It's a new program launching with a few clients. And so, uh, but I can say uh, just at Pat's point, like, but it's one of the fastest growing areas for us because um, there's just huge demand. Yeah. There's a huge demand for it right now. Got it. And, and Peter, what about you? How yeah. Yeah. Um, at, at our ML medical group uh, a side of the house, uh, we are as well integrated uh, we offer eight different service lines and a few different sort of adjacent uh, coaching efforts like smoking cessation and weight management and some, some other programs. Uh, it's all integrated all on the same uh, platform. The uh, behavioral health side of the house is surging again, as, as Ian has indicated uh, in his organization. Uh, I don't have exact numbers, but we're upwards of 40% or more of our total volume as a medical group in the disciplines of uh, therapy or psychiatry. Um, we do have inpatient psychiatry as well, where, where we perform uh, consultations. That's lower volume, but very high acuity, um, you know, partnerships directly with hospitals and emergency departments. Uh, the um, therapy, I mean, gosh, uh, you know, to the point uh, that Ian made earlier, uh, there is so much demand right now for therapy. It's, it's, it's outrageous. And, uh, uh, we can't recruit fast enough to meet that demand. Um, we can almost keep up on the therapy side. So that's why our therapy program has grown just dramatically. It's now at about almost 50% on a weekday when we offer therapy services, almost 50% of our urgent care volume on any given day, which is remarkable because these are 50 minute, you know, lengthy visits. Uh, psychiatry is uh, surging as well, but more modest, uh, coming from a more modest place because it's a slightly newer program, but also because we're, we're supply, somewhat supply constrained. There just aren't enough psychiatrists out there uh, for the need at this point. Uh, but it is, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's an, an incredibly important time to be addressing this. And, you know, I think it's, 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 it's a good thing to see that, you know, there are many of our operation, many operations like ours and Ian's out there that are, and, and Pat's uh, that are, uh, you know, opening their doors and addressing this and allowing access because there's a real need. And one of the, it is a real need. And one of the best ways to, um, to reach outcomes, um, optimal outcomes is to get people, the care teams to work together um, and the primary care doctors with the, the, the clinicians and um, or the, the therapists and the coaches and, and coordinating all of that. So the question is, what's the best way to incentivize these care teams to work toward the best outcomes? And Chris, maybe I'll start with you because that's what you're doing is helping um, these teams collaborate. What's the best way to get them to work together? I think first and foremost, you have to make sure that you don't impede their, their workflow. Uh, PCPs and therapists already have too much on their plate and adding another thing that they have to do or another data point that they have to check without it integrating into their workflow is, is not only an unreasonable ask, it's an unrealistic ask. You just aren't gonna get the adoption that you want. Uh, psychiatric collaborative care, integrated behavioral health has dozens and dozens of peer reviewed studies to show its effectiveness. And since this is a panel on efficacy, I think it's, it's important. Um, but then why is it not adopted everywhere and it's the standard of care? And I think it's that workflow burden. It's the, the perceived uh, challenge that I'm a PCP. I'm not an expert in behavioral health. I'm not going to worry about this. And that's just the wrong approach. And so if you can help them identify the issues, the, help them identify the right appropriate level of care to send that patient to or to provide with them, whether it's, um, you know, we, you asked the question about psychotropics and therapeutics and so forth. Maybe people just need a, the coaching level that Dr. and a man's offering. And so uh, understanding that difference and understanding that not every level of care is created equal and 
different people need different things, you can reduce that burden for these providers and, and make it a more realistic proposition to them. And you know, technology can help scale that for them, uh, especially in today's environment where you know a lot of things are done being done remote. People are uh, using these sorts of platforms more and more often. I do have a question for most all plat you know telehealth platforms that you're offering. They they have the generalist and a behavioral therapist flavor to it, and it's well integrated. But there are unique opportunities that you may have, especially you may not have all the coaches in house, so you may not have an opioid program in house. Do you? What the trend that I'm seeing initially, like these point solutions, will come to the employer and sell. Now, like they go to the pair and sell, but now they're actually coming to a platform like a telehealth solution, um, like like what you're offering and sell to you. Is that something that you would see in your pipeline to build a stack of solutions, jump much more deeper into these unique things and start offering off of, uh, let's say, doctors on demand or Hims and hers, uh, instead of having in-house expertise or, or, or over at MO2? Are you looking at those kinds of solutions? I could start with uh, Peter and then we could go to Pat and like Ian after. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. And it is something that, that we're uh, focused on. You know, we see behavioral health as a real spectrum, right? And um, everything from uh, stress and uh, parenting support and other, other needs, uh, you know, uh, 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 mourning, death and family, you know, um, uh, life events, uh, to, you know, mild, milder conditions, mild depression or dysthymia, to more moderate conditions. And then there are, there are sort of one-offs in there, like substance use disorder um, mm -hmm. that may require a very specialized approach. Uh, and so we really are, are interested in sort of horizontal uh, uh, broadening um, to be able to address the, the whole spectrum. And we, we recognize that number one, we don't necessarily have all the expertise in house to address all of those in the best manner, uh, number one. And number two, uh, that some of those might be better addressed using a different modality. Uh, so, uh, you know, perfectly honest and transparent, we specialize in synchronous live visits, as I mentioned before, but somebody with stress uh, or parenting uh, support needs uh, might, might equally benefit from an asynchronous or more educational approach. Uh, rather than a live synchronous one-on-one -on -one approach. Or uh, another alternative uh, is that it may be a, a group uh, visit approach might be more appropriate, for example, for uh, a number of people experiencing a similar condition. So I think we're opening our eyes to the fact that there are many different approaches and many different areas of expertise that can be applied to better meet each of these patients. And then one last point I would make just broadly for all of us is I think as, as, as a health system or as a, as a nation, we need better triage and navigation um, because what we don't need is the person who's just having some stress in their life and needs some coping mechanisms and might benefit from mindfulness. We don't need them taking an hour intake with a board certified psychiatrist um, who's really, it, it, that's really not necessary. So again, using folks at the top of their license, better triage, better navigation would, 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 would of course be helpful as well and less fragmentation. Yeah, I think that, that makes Ian very happy with the grand rounds right there in the side pocket. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Wait, wait, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just jump in and just say yeah. another way to think about that too. So thank you, Peter. Yeah, and I, love, I, love, I appreciate that. But, um, sure. but on the other end too, which I think Peter probably has this, you know, has, has a bit more experience with this, but on the other end of, of relying and, and contracting or um, and partnering with brick and mortar partners, right? So the other end of the spectrum of care where people are gonna need to, it, it, we're not gonna be on our own, even though we built this virtually, you know, you do need for certain things to have that brick and mortar partner. So, so I think you can, you can add that partnership or contracting you know, through the, on the front end, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's through the services that you deliver, like you said, the clinical services, and maybe you contract for, for those a bit. Um, as long as you have a high level of engagement from the clinician, I would say I'm, I would be comfortable with that because it's really about engagement. It doesn't have to be that they're employed, but as long as they're spending enough time on your platform and they know about your quality program and they know what to do, uh, you know, I just think they'll do a better job. But then on the, uh, but on the back end as well, you know, connecting people, um, absolutely. That's, I think that's the place where 
my mind goes, um, because I think we can do a lot of a lot of it now, you know, all the way through, but we are not going to be a brick and mortar mm -hmm. clinic or health system. We'll be a virtual health system that partners with brick and mortar. Yeah, I'd like to just add one aspect that we added to our platform that we're really proud of in terms of quality is we've partnered with a national behavioral health triage uh, company. 24 seven, if someone is decompensating and some of these folks will and become suicidal or really need a face-to-face -face evaluation, it's a 1-800 access. Um, and these folks are trained psychiatric triagers who will actually take our virtual patient and connect them to a brick and mortar uh, location to get face-to-face -face care if they have a decompensation. And that's available 24 seven, 365 days a year. We were really committed to that because we wanted a safety net first and foremost for our customers, but also for our providers, because I didn't want a provider going to bed at night and saying, well, two in the morning, this patient is part of my panel. I'm a little nervous about them. They're going to have a decompensation and what's going to happen. Am I actually going to check my computer at two in the morning, every morning? Probably not. Uh, but so we're, we're proud to offer that. And it's been very well received by our providers as we recruit them, quite honestly. That's fantastic. And, and do you, so th that's, that's almost like a solution that you integrated into your system. Are you also looking at other solutions to create a stack of solutions that you would offer to your uh, constituents or members? Yeah, so we, we have a strategy around health system partnerships and, and large medical group partnerships. We're just partnered with Privia, we partner with Oshner and, and Monsanto. So if we identify folks who need face-to-face -face care in a brick and mortar location, we can refer into those. Um, that's a tougher build because you're trying to get into 50 states. Mm -hmm. uh, so for behavioral health, that's when we sat back and said, we really need that 24 seven access point to triage to brick and mortar locations for patients with crises. Yeah, okay. awesome, thank you. Over, and I'm really sorry about that. So it's uh, pretty well over, but I'm going to let have Chris Malero have the, the last word here because, um, because we're going to, I'm not gonna have a question for you, Chris, but maybe you want to respond to uh, the question that Arshana had put out there. Yeah, no, listen, I think that we're, where there's a lot of noise in the area with technology. And if we have, um, and if we are able to use efficacy, use data to make sure that the right people are getting the right level of care and scaling the work that Dr. Naman and that Amwell's doing so that uh, Peter's, I think, said it with operating the top of your licensure, you know, a psychiatrist shouldn't be doing a um, a PHQ-9 on the telephone with somebody. That's a waste of resources and time of a valuable, valuable resource. But if we can have that psychiatrist operating and treating the right patient at the right time, you're going to see tremendous uh, improvement in outcomes, resources, and efficiency in the system. Uh, and it's, you know, it's real, it's exciting to see the adoption of these technologies, especially over the last 12 months. And to be a part of that uh, is, is really exciting and, and to see the efficacy be as effective, if not more in some cases, as brick and mortar. So uh, thanks for, for having me to be a part of the panel. Thanks, Chris. And uh, to echo what someone said in the first panel, we're, uh, we're all in this together. So everyone's a little bit different, but we're all trying to move this ball forward. Um, so everybody is doing a great job um, just um, you know, changing the way we uh, deal with our mental resilience, clearly with the volumes that I'm hearing from, from your company. So thank you, Chris. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Ian. And thank you, Peter. And hopefully you guys will stick around because we have a really great group of new startups that will be presenting, a lot of them in different verticals. So very unique. Some of them, many of them you might even want to partner with. So I'm going to hand this over to Mark Goldstein of UCSF Health Hub. And finally, I get to sit up from my chair after about three hours, so. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. Thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you.